Good evening, Erev Tov, and welcome back to Rabbis on the Run, our amazing series following rabbis who are running from persecution and oppression, managed to contribute nevertheless to great scholarship, the continuity of Torah, Torah tradition, Torah learning. And uh, it's a great honor tonight to be able to talk about one of the great rabbis, the sixth Rebbe of Chabad, the Friedrich Rebbe, and the story of the Rayats and how he was saved. But first, I want to thank our uh, generous sponsors for this amazing program. Hani and Lenny Grunstein, in memory of their fathers, Morris Grunstein and Aaron Tambor. Thank you so much for your generosity and sponsorship. I don't know if they are here. They're not here. Okay, you'll tell them they were thanked. And we're grateful. It's the right thing to thank them, even if they're not here. We should have charged them more to not come. But if they're, uh, you'll tell them anyway. Also, tonight's uh, learning, all the learning in the show right now is dedicated. The Fu Shlema Speedy and a painless and a full recovery. The two young members of our shul, Esther Tehila Basari al Tzipora. Carmel Shai Ben Reza, we should have a complete and a speedy refuah shleimah. There's a fascinating topic we have tonight. We're not going to do it justice. None of the topics we cover do it justice. I can only speak for myself. The other rabbis are extraordinary. But both because of the time allotment, but more importantly because of my own inadequacy. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an academic, nor do I have the time to research thoroughly. But I did try to cull together as much information as possible to be able to communicate, at least to be able to be somewhat literate on this issue, on this topic, which is a phenomenal story. It's a more recent story. The last time I spoke, it was about the Russia, Benu Asher, and how he ran away in the Middle Ages from France and Germany to Spain. There were no pictures. There were no letters that are extant. There's a lot of history, but it's somewhat unrelatable. It really is a long time ago. This story, in great contrast, is relatable. Not that many, all, most of us are alive then, but... The Friedrich Rebbe is not an ancient figure, but somebody who lived relatively in our time. He lived 1880 to 1950. He was the sixth Rebbe of Chabad, also known as the Friedrich. The Friedrich in Yiddish means the previous Rebbe. So we know there was a tradition within Chabad that there would only be seven Rebbes. The seventh represents wholeness completion. The Rebbe, known as today the Rebbe of Menachem Mendel Schneerson, Zatzal, was the Rebbe, the last and final Lubavitcher Rebbe. So his father-in-law was known as the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, Rav, Yitz, Rav Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, also known by his acronym, Rav Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson. Rav Yosef Yitzchak is the Rayatz. Rayatz is a Hebrew acronym for his name. Now, I want to give credit, even before we begin, to two wonderful works that really, uh, for the most part, helped me prepare and try to call again. I highly recommend reading both of these works inside. If you're curious and want to know more about this topic, uh, I highly recommend them. One is a book by... Chaim Miller called Turning Judaism Outward. It's a biography of the seventh Rebbe, of the Rebbe of Benachem Mendel Schneerson. Uh, several summers ago, on the Rebbe's 20th year at site, many biographies came out simultaneously about the Rebbe. One by Steinsaltz, that's all, uh, one by Rabbi Telushkin, and one by Chaim Miller. And uh, they were all each in their own right added something. Uh, Chaim Miller's I found um, arguably most compelling because it wasn't only filled with inspiring stories, it is very scholarly, it's very academic. Everything was researched, everything is footnoted, everything is sourced. And it really is a wonderful work from the Rebbe, from his birth and the journeys of his life. So there's a significant amount. When the Rebbe was in Europe, he was separated from his father-in-law. He was in Paris, uh, ultimately, and we'll, we'll get to that part of the story. But there's a lot in here about the story of the rescue of the Rayats. I highly recommend. The essential authoritative work on this topic is written not by a Lubavitcher, but written by someone named Brian Mark Rigg. Brian Mark Rigg, his first book was called Hitler's Jewish Soldiers. We're going to touch on this tonight. Somewhat shocking if you're not familiar with it, but there were about 150,000 soldiers in the German army, which is not synonymous with being a Nazi, but the German army under the Nazis, 150,000 of them were at least half Jewish or a quarter Jewish, had a, had a component of being Jewish. He really researched that um, and and became the authoritative scholarly work on it. It's called Hitler's Jewish Soldiers. And his second book is called Rescued from the Reich, How One of Hitler's Soldiers Saved the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He's a fascinating individual, the author himself, grew up with a significant learning disability, was almost denied an education because of it, ultimately goes to uh, Cambridge, Oxford, Columbia, I forgot which, uh, Ivy League schools. And at 21 years old, he's, he's brought up thinking he's Christian. At 21 years old, he discovers he's Jewish. He goes to learn in yeshiva in Yerushalayim, ultimately does not embrace the full Torah way of life, a fascinating person himself, the author of this book. But this really, um, for the first time, he spent an enormous amount of time and researched 10,000 documents and 70 books and uh, firsthand testimonials. And the whole story we're about to share tonight 
he really documents and research. If you want to know it and see it well, it's in here. Um, much of it you'll appreciate. Parts of its conclusion, Chabad, and uh, those who are an extension of that community might not fully appreciate uh, some of the conclusions he draws or his postscript to the story. But all of that is by way of introduction where we got a lot of our information from. So Rav Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, the Rayats, was born in Lubavitch, the only son of the Rebbe Rashab, of the fifth Rebbe, of Rav Shalom Dov Ber Schneerson. He was appointed as his father's personal secretary already at the age of 15. You would expect nothing less from him to be precocious, to be bright, uh, overachiever. And already at 15 years of age, he was, so to say, a personal secretary of his father. What better training is there to become a Rebbe than to be the personal secretary of your father, who is the Rebbe before you? 1897, he gets married at the age of 17. He's a little old. He got married at the ripe old age, just joking, of 17. He married his third cousin, the Hamadina Schneerson, who was a granddaughter of the Tzemach Tzedek. He married his third cousin. In 1898, 1898, he was appointed the head of the network of Tomchei Tamimim Yeshiva. Lubavitch had a network of yeshivas spread all over, and he was the head of that network already, also at a relatively young age. 1915, fast forward. After the community was uprooted in its home in Lubavitch, Lubavitch is Chabad, the Alter Rebbe is course, monumental work, magnum opus, Chabad, Chachma Bina Das, the name of, of the of the Hasidus is based on that integration of Chachma Bina and Das, Chabad. Lubavitch is the name of a city. That's where it was founded. After the Bashem Tov, one of the Talmidim, the Atar Rebbe, and uh, Shnei Zaman of Liadi, we gave a people of the book about him. You can find it online if you want to know more about Shnei Zaman of Liadi, the Atar Rebbe, and the early parts of Lubavitch. So 1915, the community is uprooted from Lubavitch as a result of World War I. Fast forward five more years, 1920, the Rebbe Rashab, his nifter, passes away. And that is when the Rayats, that is when Rav Yosef Yitzchak takes over and is appointed as the Rebbe. He's the last living remnant of the Chabad Lubavitch dynasty that is on the move and frankly is on decline. That's not a statement or comment about Lubavitch at the time, 1915, 1920, but rather it's a reflection of what's happening all around them. Lubavitch is in Russia and there was enormous upheaval, the Russian Revolution of 1917, the anti-religious Bolsheviks who were victorious and wanted to uproot all of religious life. There was a, a negative impact not only on Chabad Hasidus, on Lubavitch, but Hasidus on the whole was on the decline. There were winds of change that were um, blistering throughout Russia and throughout Eastern Europe, winds of modernity, and uh, many adherents of Hasidus were lost. They gave up their Hasidus. And they became uh, proponents. They subscribed to the Haskalah, socialism, nationalism, secular Zionism, and so on. So the Rashab's only son, the Rayats, took over. And contrary to the cynics of the time, who were ready to declare the end of Hasidus, or Lubavitch in particular, was struggling against that backdrop because it was so heavily based in Russia, uh, contrary to the predictions of the cynics, uh, the Rebbe, the Rayats, proved to be a very powerful and effective leader and really changed Lubavitch from being on the decline to being on the rise. He had a tremendous attention to detail, a tremendous vision, tremendous memory. He had a tremendous koach, a great power to write. He was a prolific writer, not only of Torah novelty, of Torah thoughts, but capturing his youth, his childhood, capturing the customs of Chabad, the culture of Chabad. He recorded his memories of Hasidic life for posterity. 1922, two years after he becomes the Rebbe, the Rayats formed the Committee of Rabbis to implement the funds that he had raised from all over the world because he had this vision, not only of trying to preserve what was and to stop and stem the decline, but to actually turn it around to expand, to proliferate, to have the movement grow. So he created this community of rabbis uh, to help Rabbanim, Machanchem, and Shochtim, to help rabbis, educators, and ritual slaughterers, Shochtim, and by 1925, so 1922, we had this vision of this umbrella rabbinic training organization. And in only five years, five years later, his executive offices were in contact, helping and supporting 700 communities. 700 communities that he had helped place, Rabbanim, Machanachem, and Shochtim. You see the vision, the attention to detail, the execution. You can already see a precursor to his son-in-law, to the Rebbe, who creates an army and a network all over the world, that dwarfs the 700 at the time. But this was against a very hostile backdrop. And remember the cynics who predicted the continued decline and ultimately even predicted the demise. 
Um, the Rayats is Fabrengens, you know, Hasidic, particularly in Chabad, a gathering where friends connect, they gather, have Torah conversation, but just also enjoy the company of what it means to be together, to sing, to uplift their soul. His Fabrengens were warm and they were intimate, unlike what we think of the previous Rebbe's, the, the most recent Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson's Fabrengens, which were essentially long mamarim and sichos. They were um, brilliant, lengthy, hours long deliveries of, of Torah ideas, the Rayatz's Fabrengans were, um, had a dialogue. He would take questions and he would respond or he would direct the particular message to a particular chassid. They were much more personal, much more intimate, much more directed. He exuded a, a tremendous love and he was not shy to share affection with his chassidim. He told stories, a little bit of a backdrop of who he was when he took over and the chassidus he was leading. In fact, the, uh, the seventh Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, would recall the inspirational and heroic qualities of his father-in-law. And here I'm going to read to you a translation of what the Rebbe said about his father-in-law, about the Friedrich Rebbe, about the Rayats. He said, I trust you know of his total dedication to the preservation and indeed dissemination of the Torah way, even under the most ruthless, anti-religious, totalitarian regime. Logically, it was not the slightest chance he could possibly succeed, especially after all other religious leaders had been silenced or eliminated. So the Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, created a network and an army of Chabad Rebbe, and he sent it all over America, let's say. This was a free country, religious freedom, very welcoming, very warm. The Rayats began to create and spread his network, and, and the Rebbe is describing his father-in-law against all odds, against all logic, and an anti-religious totalitarian regime. His work was not confined to the Hasidic community, as you know, to all sections of Jewry, including what you call, quote-unquote, the other camp. Now, I don't know if that means misnagdim. I don't know if that means secular Jews, the other camp. I don't know what he refers to. Supporting materially and spiritually rabbis, yeshivas, religious institutions, also of the other camp, and with the same selflessness and peril to his personal safety as he worked for the Hasidic community. This he did from the profound conviction that there are no two camps in the Jewish people. Jewish people is one people united by one Torah under one God. He's talking about the misnagdim. He's talking about those who were opposed to Hasidus. But the rayats did not, the Friedrich Rebbe did not retreat to only care about, so to say, his own, but was devoted, cared, and took care of all those around him. 1924, again, Russia's increasingly hostile environment, anti-religious anti environment, increasingly unsafe environment. In the secret ceremony in Moscow, in 1924, the Rayats identified and chose and met with eight of his most talented graduates of the Babach Yeshiva, and quote, we took a solemn oath that whatever would transpire, we're willing to pursue this mission down to our very last drop of blood. These eight students took upon their shoulders the responsibility that no matter what would happen, no matter what persecution, they would continue to spread the teachings, the Torah, the light of Hasidus. And they found yeshivas. They founded yeshivas. The Soviets were closing them down and they were opening up new ones. Against a tremendous and a dangerous threat, these eight Talmidim, these eight Hasidim, made that promise in that secret meeting, 1924, they would do it. 1924, there was a relocation of Chabad. It had moved from Lubavitch, and now it relocates uh, to Petersburg, 1924. After the near arrest and the subsequent expulsion of the Rayats from Rostov, it was a watershed moment. Now, Chabad Hasidim know that, you know, Petersburg before and after is not only a demarcation to reference in time the Rayats long before him, the Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe, is demarcated by two periods of his life or two geographical locations of his life. And here his descendant, um, uh, the sixth Rebbe, has a similar distinction. Before Petersburg, Petersburg, 1924, Chabad courts, Chabad Hasidus, was located in small, remote towns. Uh, Liozna, Liadi, Lubavitch, these were smaller towns. And after 1924, they migrated, they moved to major cities. Riga, Atwak, which is near Warsaw, which we'll talk about, and ultimately, today, Crown Heights, New York, a metropolis, a bustling city, one of the largest uh, cities in the entire world. And reflecting on this in 1952, Seventh Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, said about his father-in-law, he said, the Rebbes that preceded him, they presided over, they were shepherd Rebbes. They provided over small towns, villages, they presided over the flock of Hasidim in the small town. But the Rayats became the first metropolis Rebbe. He was the Rebbe of a Hasidus that had migrated and moved and that needed to adapt to the big city, to a metropolis, a whole different way 
of thinking, of living, and trained those Hasidim, empowered and inspired them how to live within the city. His approach was a centralized leadership, as we talked about, this network of yeshivas, a network of communities. It was a powerful, powerful force until ultimately he was arrested and forced to leave the country. And uh, the Soviets were increasing. They were escalating their persecution by the month. Almost every Jewish leader had left Russia by this point, by this time. It was simply unsafe. They were targeted. And it came to a head on Purim 1927 in a Fabrengen in Leningrad. And here we have a description from the memoirs of a chassid, Velio Chaim Altos, who was present at this Fabrengen 1927. And he writes the following. The Rebbe spoke openly, sharply, and intensely. He wept. His face flushed with emotion, and his voice was an anger we had never heard before. In the midst of the Purim Suda, the Rebbe suddenly stood up, calling out, El Yechayim, El Yechayim, I told you to write harshly last year, but you didn't listen. And this is why there has been so much suffering all year. After Shabbos, you'll write a letter to all the cities and villages with these words. We possess the Rebbe, and he left us his son to guide us. And the son has instructed us to write in his name that anyone handing his child over to the school of the Vyaskdivia, I'm mispronouncing that, but that was the Russian uh, system, will be severely punished by heaven. Will you write this? Remember well what I say to you. He repeated the words again and again, pounding on his chest. The Hasidim were alarmed. The Rebbe's open defiance of the Russians. One of the senior Hasidim cried out, Rebbe, we cannot stand to hear such words. We need a Rebbe of flesh and blood. We were actually aware of the spies in our midst, as they had been at every Hasidic gathering since our arrival in Leningrad. The Russians, communists even before, had the equivalent of the KGB trailing their targets long before. So the Hasidim knew that at that Fabreng, in that Purim Suda, there were spies for the Russian oppressors. So the fact that the Rebbe so vehemently, adamantly, vociferously, unapologetically, with no nuance, was defiantly opposing them, he was putting his life at risk. We begged the Rebbe to stop, but he faced them directly and he cried. He turned to the spies in the room, knowing who they were, and he said, May their names be blotted out, Yamach Shemam. I know they're here, I'm not afraid of them. We gazed at the agents and their faces flushed with anger, deepened our concern for the Rebbe's welfare. Now it's fascinating, the rest of the story, he writes in his memoir, the Rayat's his mother was called to intervene. Rebbe Tznishterna Sara. The Rayat's mother was still alive and was there, not in the room. So the Hasidim, you know, when people want to get me to behave, they call my mother and they say when, you know, with the board, with the executive board, the president, when all hope is lost, my wife, my kids, you get them, the rabbi's mother involved, now you're going to get your way. So they called the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Tznishterna Sara, um, and to beg to stop him from incriminating himself further. His life was literally at risk, what he was doing. And the Rayats respectfully begged her to go back to her room. He started to cry. And seeing this, she began to sob. And everybody in the room, not much of a Purim Suda, everybody in the room um, erupted in tears. And he regained his composer, composure and the Rayats tried to console his mother. And um, nothing happened to him at that particular gathering, but it was sort of a turning point because his defiance ultimately came back. He wasn't arrested, but three months later, he was finally detained. The Russians had their eye on him. They accused him legitimately or falsely of violating several of their rules about hosting uh, religious institutions and schools and teaching Torah. And uh, his undercover activities were well known. He was under surveillance, and therefore they came to get him. But right before they came to get him, his soon-to-be son-in-law, who was not yet married to his daughter, the seventh Rebbe, um, describes having come in to see his father-in-law. Knowing his father-in-law was about to embark on an important trip and that the likelihood is that he would get arrested and may even be sentenced to death on this important journey. He expected to go into his father-in-law's study, the Friedrich Rebbe study, and find him saying to Hillam, shaking, crying, planning, worried. Instead, he found him incredibly, incredibly calm. Incredibly calm. And he didn't understand it. So he asked his father-in-law, and the Rayats explained that he had learned this from his grandfather. This is not directly related to our story. We're not even up to our story. But I think the background is fascinating, but there's also something to learn from this. I was really wowed from this. He learned from his grandfather, Marash, an art that's called success in time. I'm sure there's a Yiddish description of it. I don't know what it is. But success in time. Essentially, the ability to be fully immersed in the here and now. To be so fully present in whatever's happening that you don't have anxiety or worry or fear, that you don't have trauma or stress or negative memory, that you're not living with any other emotion than what you're experiencing in that moment. Focusing on the task at hand 
living to the exclusion of all of the concerns and all of the worries and all of the to do and all of the plans, the capacity to be in the moment. The Rayat cited the example of the Rajba, Shlomo Ben Adaris, the great Risha, and the Rajba, who gave three Torah classes a day and answered complex questions, and he would manage to take a leisurely stroll every day. And when the Rajba was asked, how do you have such a peace of mind, such a manucha sanefesh? How are you silly, so fully present? You go for a walk every day when there are a million things you have to do. And he talked about the ability to compartmentalize and to be hyper-focused on what you're doing. And so the Rebbe related that he learned this and heard about this from his shver, from the Friedrich Rebbe, from his father-in-law, this capacity called success in time, to be fully immersed, fully present in whatever you are experiencing in that moment. 15th of June, which corresponded with the 15th of Sivan that year. It was a Tuesday night. The Rebbe the Rayats had just finished five hours of Yechidus, private audiences with his chassidim. He needed guidance, advice, and brachos. And the GPU, which is the state political directorate, the intelligence service and the secret police of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, otherwise known by their convenient acronym, the GPU, at these five hours of Yechidas that he was meeting Hasidim privately, they burst into his home and they arrested him. Now, knowing, knowing that he could be arrested at any time, in fact, there's actually a description, a testimonial of how it happened, where they said, we're looking for are you here? And he said, let's stop the whole charade. You know who I am. I know who you are. Basically, take me away if that's what you're here to do. Kind of called them out. And there are several episodes in his life where he was defiant, where he was, maybe it's courage. You could argue it was very risky, but where he refused to bend or cower to the authorities, be they the Russians or later the Germans and the Nazis. And he faced them. This is one example of it. He knew that he was at risk. He was being followed. So he did not keep his, ne- his documentation of the network of yeshivas and shochtim and rabbanim of all Torah learning, everything that was against all the Russian laws. He did not keep it at his house. He kept it at the home of his secretary, Reb Chaim Lieberman. However, he knew that right after he was being arrested, the likelihood was the next stop for the GPU was going to be this Reb Lieberman. So what happened was he uh, dispatched the Rebbe, Reb Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the seventh Rebbe, again, not yet married to his daughter, but already engaged. And he made a beeline to Rechaim Lieberman's home where they destroyed all the evidence, got rid of all the documentation before the GPU were able to get to Rev Lieberman's home. Both the Rayats and Lieberman were arrested that night. They were taken to the Spalerno prison where the Rebbe was sentenced to death because of his activities against the Russian government. Now, the Rebbe was a very prominent individual. There were 150 Lubavitch Hasidim in America already at the time, let alone the hundreds of thousands of Lubavitch Hasidim, in Russia, predominantly in Russia, but also expanding to other places as well. He was well known. So there was a worldwide storm of outrage, and pressure was put to bear immediately from Western governments, and even, it's hard to imagine this today, from the International Red Cross, who argued that these were false charges, and he was not deserving of the death penalty, and violated a capital crime, and they advocated for the Friedrich Rebbe's release. News arrived to Germany, and the chief rabbi of Germany at the time, you know who it was? It's a seminary in his name, Rabbi Hildesheimer, and very prominent reform rabbi in Germany at the time, known as Rabbi Leo Beck, also lobbied the government of Russia for the Friedrich Rebbe's safety and for his release. Political pressure came, and it came strong. England, France, Scandinavia, Rav Kook from Eretz Yisrael, first chief rabbi of Palestine, it was Palestine, not Israel yet, but Rav Kook put pressure as well, not only from these uh, countries, other prominent Jews. There was a Supreme Court justice, who a university is now named for him, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, approached the government officials. He too joined the campaign that the Friedrich Rebbe, the head of Lubavitch, the sixth Rebbe, should not be put to death. He should be released. Ultimately, President Calvin Coolidge petitioned himself, his counterpart, and uh, the death sentence was was called off. In fact, the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, described that he later actually with his own eyes saw the file and he saw his the command for his execution, he saw it crossed out. You can imagine what that means to see a Russian document with the uh, command for your execution and he saw it crossed out. But ultimately he was still found guilty, although was not meant to be put to death. July 30 was informed that his sentence would be reduced to three years, but he'd be three years in Kostroma. He could go home for six hours, get his affairs in order, and would have to report back by 8 p.m., and he would be sent off for this three-year sentence in uh, 
K-O-S-T-R-O-M-A, some Kostroma pronounced. Uh, but he went there, he reported, he went, and just eight days after his arrival, which coincided with his 47th birthday, he was informed that, in fact, he was totally free. The sentence had been commuted because the political pressure continued. So not only had they spared his life, but in fact, the three-year sentence had even been commuted. He was free. That Shabbos, he benched Gomel with his Hasidim, but his freedom was somewhat limited. Now, after his release, Rayat, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, went to Eretz Yisrael. He went to Israel, Palestine at the time. He went to go visit the holy graves of tzaddikim, local yeshivas and Torah centers. He met with the great rabbis and the leaders of the Jewish community, the yeshuv in Eretz Yisrael. He was there in August, for August 7th to the 22nd, 1929. And he left Israel just before the Arab massacre of Hebron. We know on August 24th, 70 Jews were murdered in cold blood, a massacre. Why? Because they, we were occupiers of their land. It was 1929. We didn't occupy one inch of land. They were massacring us then, having nothing to do with occupying, and still today, but we will leave that aside. That is not our topic for tonight. He also went from Israel on a trip, or Palestine at the time. He went to the United States. He visited. This is not, remember, this was not, he didn't take a private plane. You know, a Rebbe today, they arrange a private plane, a limousine service, you know, to be a Rebbe today. He went from New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Detroit, Boston, and Chicago. July 10th, he met President Herbert Hoover at the White House. Uh, he was the Republican, earlier as the Republican presidential candidate, Hoover, as we mentioned, was one of the people who had lobbied for his release when he was arrested by the Russians. While he was in America on this tour, the Lubavitch Hasidim, who numbered not few, begged the Rebbe to stay. He was unsafe to return. What had happened in, in Russia, uh, in Lubavitch, in Leningrad, where, where he was moving. But he said that uh, he had to go back. And the reason he wanted to go back, and there's an irony, is America was an irreligious place where even the rabbis shaved their beards. Because America was an irreligious place, and we know at the time there were many who predicted that you could not be a firm Jew, there was no future to Torah way of life, to Orthodox living in America. Even the rabbis shaved their beards. So he left the United States to return to Riga, Latvia on July 17th, 19, 1930. Now, the Russians, when he came back, had not given up. They continued to target him, to follow him, and to imprison him. And it became clear it was very dangerous for him to continue his underground activities. He had flirted with danger once. He was lucky to have had the backing and the pressure, international pressure, that secured his release. But it continued to be increasingly dangerous. Chabad act activists began to look for exit visas for the Rayats and his family to immigrate to be able to have a safe and secure future. Rabbi Mordechai Dubin, Chabad Chassid, a representative of the Latvian parliament, prevailed on the Soviets to allow the Rayats to leave. It wasn't so simple. You didn't only need a visa to enter, but you needed permission to exit. So he prevailed with his Latvian connections on the Soviets to allow the Rayats to leave. He was told he could leave, but he would have to leave his family and his library. Now the Rayats had accumulated, had amassed a library of 40,000 books, manuscripts, svarim that went back to the 17th century, to the 1600s, original manuscripts. He had an incredibly valuable and mystically valuable, and there was a mystical connection that he had and Chabad had to this collection of svarim. So he was told he could leave, but he couldn't take his family or his library, and he refused both. If he couldn't leave with both, he wasn't going. The pressure continued. September 28th, full permission was granted. And on Thursday, the 20th of October, which was Isruchag, the day after Simcha's Torah, the Rayats and his family left Russia with his possessions and library. They filled four full railway carriages with their books and the possessions. Did not travel lightly. Last night, late at night, one of my daughters went to New York to start uh, college finally in person, not on Zoom. So I had the luggage scale and I was busy with her luggage and one pound, a little more, three more ounces you could put in, four wagon uh, railway carriages of Sfar. That's overweight. But they did. They arrived in Riga just in time for Shabbos. So the Rebbe was out of his normal habitat environment. So his future son-in-law, seventh Rebbe, Benachem Endo Schneerson, served as his temporary secretary in 1927. When we talk about a secretary, this is not somebody not to diminish or minimize Anyone who does make coffee or do filing, it's very important work and valuable work. But that's not what we mean by a Rebbe's secretary. 
the Rebbe's secretary is not doing clerical work per se, but they're their right hand. They're the intermediary, they're the shamash, they're the, they're the gatekeeper, they're the communicator, they're the spokesperson, they're doing a lot more. So the chief of staff in, in many ways. So Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the seventh Rebbe, was a, se- a temporary secretary. And in fact, in, in Chaim Miller's book, you see the Rebbe had such a close connection to his father-in-law from those years of being on the run, persecuted, and being really his close confidant when there wasn't a big network and a big chutzer, a big, a big group of chassidim. It's very, very special, and we'll see in a moment also. He really took care of them medically. The Rebbe the Rayatz's health failed, and his future son-in-law, his son-in-law, is really the one who helped take care of him. Um, the Rayatz convened a meeting. He's now in Riga, Latvia. He's outside of Russia, very, very concerned of what's happening to the Jews of Russia. So he convenes a meeting of uh, many of the prominent esteemed rabbis of the time in order to address this issue. So who are these rabbis? There's the chief rabbi of Riga, Menachem Mendel Zak, of Hildesheimer, the Raga Trevor Gon, who right after that meeting announced he would no longer be attending any more meetings. He just wanted to learn. None of this askanas, none of this uh, Jewish communal leadership work. No, I don't blame him at all, the Raga Trevor. He did not have uh, a head for that. And, um, and at this time, his son-in-law took leave of him and went to Berlin, where he went to go study at the University of Berlin and ultimately earned a degree, questionable, completed the degree, engineering, but went to go study. There's a whole discussion in Miller's book about this as well, because Chabad historically had been opposed to secular studies, certainly opposed to attending university or college. So how did that conversation go that his son-in-law said, we're in Riga, we're settled, I took care of you for a bit, I'm heading to university. University of Berlin, where his contemporaries there, by the way, were Rav Soloveitchik and and Rav Hutner. Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Hutner. Um, after returning from his trip to Israel, the United States, 1929-1930, the Rebbe had felt exhausted. Something was wrong. He felt something was wrong. He had been forced to spend the summer months at healing spas in Marenbaum, Czechoslovakia. He needed to be, in those times, people went towards uh, spas and... Um, they called the underground the hot springs. And there were certain communities that were vacation spots and resort spots. We think of them today as vacation resort spots. Then they were really healing spots. They were therapeutic and medicinal people who needed to, uh, to be healed. Rosh Hashanah that year, he noticed that his speech had slowed. He struggled to be able to produce a loud voice and he mumbled. January of 1933, he went to Berlin for treatment. And there he was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis. And the prognosis was bad and his health began to decline from them. It's an important part of the story. I know so far we're a long way in and we haven't gotten to our story yet, but the background is important. And it's important to know this because it means the rest of the Friedrich Rebbe's run, being on the run, he was wheelchair bound. He, someone with multiple sclerosis is, is facing agonizing pain, difficult immobility, and the Rayats, the Rebbe the Rayats was running for his life with also facing and balancing this illness, his health gradually declined. At the end of 1933, he relocated his court. Now they moved from Riga, Latvia, and they moved to Warsaw, Poland. By the winter of 1935, at only age 54 years old, now the Rebbe the Rayats was having difficulty walking or talking. He relocated his court again from Warsaw to a resort town about 15 miles just southeast of Warsaw called Atwak, and the main yeshiva moved with him. You know, it's a big deal. I, I tried to picture this today. It doesn't transfer to a community. You know, if a rabbi who's part of a community says, I believe we should move to whatever other community, they say, take care. Maybe if you're lucky, we'll make a dinner. We'll uh, dedicate a Sefer Torah. We'll do something nice. We'll try to remember you. In those days, a rabbi moved. Everybody picked up and moved. Everybody picked up and moved. The yeshiva, the kol, and the shechtim, and the, everybody picked up and moved, and he did not move a few times. We've already seen Lubavitch had moved from within Russia several places to Riga, Latvia, to Warsaw, to Atwak, and they all moved with him. The next few years included a lot of trips that he took for medical assistance, Vienna, Paris, other places for treatment. The Rebbe at the time smoked many packs a day, which is not a criticism of the Rebbe. Nobody, no contemporaries knew then what we know now, but in retrospect certainly was not helping his health or his situation. His condition continued to decline, couldn't walk. He mumbled when he spoke. It was actually a story, which we won't get into, of uh, actually the Rayats having met Freud. is a whole story, part of the past. 
all of our story now really begins. Our story now really begins. The heroic rescue and the absolutely unpredictable rescue of the Rebbe, the Rayats, begins in September 1939. Because September 1st, 1939, 1.5 million German troops moved across the border into Poland. Poland at the time had 3.3 million Jews. And by 1945, that 3.3 million was down to a couple hundred thousand at most. Half of those killed came from Poland, and uh, it was an enormous percentage of world Jewry. And uh, that move, that September 1939, changed the Jewish people forever when the Germans took 1.5 million German troops across that border into Poland, and the lives of the 3.3 million Jews who lived there, of course, most were lost and forever changed. Um, barbaric acts had been done in front of the Wehrmacht commanders, some of whom saw it and protested. We don't have time and I'm not qualified, um, but it's important here to be accurate with the history. Um, in fact, Yehuda Geber, who has a wonderful podcast about Jewish history sound bites, is a wonderful, we've become friendly, he's wonderful. I highly encourage you to listen to them. They're fantastic. His name is Yehuda Geber, Jewish history sound bites. When he actually spoke about a very um, scaled down version of this story, he spent a lot of the time as someone who led countless trips to Poland and to that area and is well read and somewhat of an expert on Holocaust studies. He's bothered by how some who tell this story inaccurately use words inappropriately. To be a German soldier did not necessarily mean that you were a Nazi. To be a member of the of the Secret Service of the Germans was not the same thing as being SS. To be a so when people casually tell the story, they talk about how SS guards saved the Rebbe the Rayats, or the Nazis saved him himself. And he spent significant time, if you listen to Yudhi Geber's um, short version of this, really getting to the accurate description of who the terms and what they had done. So, you know, we have this image. We, who are not as uh, well-read or comprehensively sophisticated understanding the Holocaust, that sort of, you know, Hitler came to power and he was this demagogue and the Germans were all Nazis who got behind him and then the Holocaust happened and they killed six million people. That's, that's a sort of um, oversimplified to say the least, version of the story. But it's not so simple because there were lifelong Germans, German officers and members of the German army who had served in World War I and the like, who subscribed to, to Hitler's nationalism, who believed that Germany should recover some of the territory it had lost in World War I and so on, but did not believe and subscribe and vehemently rejected and even acted against Hitler's barbaric uh, acts, Hitler's inhumane uh, targeting, the final solution of the Jews and of, of others. So there were military legions um, who, and there were high-ranking officials who, while part of them proudly continued to serve in the German army under the democratically elected Nazi government, but who this component of the Nazi agenda, of Hitler's agenda, they did not entirely, entirely believe in. And among those, First of all, if you look at the booklet I handed out, I failed to show you these pictures. If you're watching online, then you don't get the booklet. I'm sorry. I'll post it later uh, with the, uh, with the uh, recording. Um, here's a picture in July 1930 of the Rebbe the Rayats with President Hoover when he met with him when he came to that trip in America. Amazing picture. There his health had not yet failed, and he was on that trip to Israel, to Palestine, and America. That is July 1930, the Rebbe Rayats with President Hoover. The next page... Um, we'll get to the letter asking for help, but turn to the third page, and there on the top is Admiral is Admiral uh, Wilhelm Canaris, who's the head of the Abwehr, the German Military Secret Service. That is a very high-ranking position in the German army, and there is a picture of him. He's wearing a German uniform. Again, the German army is the army of the Nazi uh, government of, of Hitler, and he, while again a proud German fighting for the German nationalism, he believed that these atrocities that Hitler was doing, they in fact brought shame to the German people. And they should stop and they should be removed. And um, Hitler was more concerned with ridding Poland of the Jews than really representing or fighting for, for Germany. Thursday, the 19th of September, 1939. Germany is now in Poland and they make their way to Atwak. The students of Tom de Tamimim on that date it's Thursday night, the 19th of September, 1939, and the Talmidim of the Tomchei Tamimim of Atwak had gathered for a Fabrengen. And when morning broke, all of a sudden they heard bombs. The Germans had invaded Poland. They had made their way to Warsaw. 
and to this town 15 miles southeast of Warsaw. A bomb, in fact, struck the Rebbe's house, but nobody was injured. And there are countless stories, maybe maybe uh, literate, maybe... Um, no, what's the word I'm looking for? No, come on, we have a room of smart people here. What's the room? Sometimes a story that's embellished, made up, but... No, no, no. Apocryphal. Thanks, Mom. Apocryphal. There you go. Apo- Thanks, Ma. Otherwise, I was going to wake you all at three in the morning when the word came to me. So you're lucky. You should all thank my mother. Whether it's apocryphal or literal, but there are several stories of the Rebbe the Rayats during that time um, where bombs fell in areas he was and he was uninjured. Most of the stories include, actually, that everyone else was killed. One time, a building he was in, right after he walked out, was hit by a bomb. Everyone in it was killed. Another, a courtyard that threw the Rebbe across the courtyard. And he had a concussion, but he survived, and everyone else in the courtyard was killed. And the Hasidim, again, whether documented literal, apocryphal, it doesn't matter. But there are several stories of the miraculous uh, way that the Rebbe survived against all odds, and he should not have. So that Thursday night, 19th September, September 1939, these Bachram of Tomchei are having a Fabrengen when they hear the bombs of the Nazis and they strike. Rav Yisrael Jacobson, who was a fourth generation Shochet, who had a Lubavitcher, who had emigrated to New York, and while he was yet in Russia, had begged the Rayats to move years earlier, he was already now in America, so he was, he now began to try to get the Rebbe out. As the Germans had invaded Poland, and the Rebbe barely survived with his life from a bombing of the city he was in, from America, where he had moved earlier, having begged the Rebbe to come with him then, now he barely spoke English, he had no network, no staff, no infrastructure, but he had something which is almost unstoppable. I've seen this in our community and among my friends. When you have a Lubavitcher who has a will and a tenacity and a resilience and is bent on getting something done, it doesn't matter if they speak the language, if they're articulate or eloquent, if they're persuasive, or if they have resources. They're going to find a way to get it done. And this sheikh, this fourth generation sheikh, who had come to New York earlier from there, decided he was going to get it done. And so that's this remarkable story begins. So when the Germans had invaded Poland, they begged the Rebbe to leave, and he said he wouldn't. He said, Hitler has to leave, not me. Again, we've seen the defiance of the Rayat several times. Let Hitler leave, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, that quickly changed as the threat escalated and the danger increased and the bombing and, and the writing was on the wall of what was happening and what was going to happen. So what happened is the following. On his trip in 1930, the Rebbe had met, and we saw that picture, Hoover, Brandeis, Senator Wagner, so the Lubavitchers in America decided to contact the very people that the Rebbe had begun a relationship with to now go advocate on his behalf for a rescue plan. They agreed, and it went up the chain of command, and it went up to the Secretary of State, who ultimately got the approval of Roosevelt. And a few days later, a telegram went from the American embassy in Berlin, find the Rebbe and rescue him. It's extraordinary. Because of those relationships on that trip years earlier, the Americans, who, remember, were not yet in the war, decided to use their diplomatic connections and to apply dipl- diplomatic pressure, and therefore Roosevelt himself backed it, and the telegram went to the American embassy in Berlin to find the Rebbe and to rescue him. The, this was the United States State Department was involved, many Jewish leaders were lobbying, and, um, and, it, and it got there. Now just picture this for a moment. You're in the American embassy in Berlin, and you're supposed to go find the Rebbe and rescue him. How do you do that? What's the plan? So through the, the efforts, ultimately, he was granted diplomatic immunity, the Rebbe, and he was given safe passage, but they had to find him. They had to get him. So the plan was how to do it, how to do it. Meaning the Germans themselves gave him immunity and agreed that he could leave, but you have to go find him and get him out. So how'd they do it? So they established contact with the head of the German Secret Service, this Admiral Willem Canaris, whose picture you see here on the top of page three. And he agreed to help. Now, why did he agree to help? Shocking, right? He's he's got a Nazi, a German uniform, and he's the head of the German Secret Service. And he agrees to go find a Hasidische Rebbe and to get him out, to get him out of Poland. He agreed. Why? Because he had disagreed with the Nazi approach. In fact, so defiant was he, again, proud of German nationalism, 
but against what Hitler was doing with genocide, a final solution, barbaric acts. So he in fact hired Jews and the opportunity to save a Jew for him was not an inconvenience or something that went against him. It was actually a perfect opportunity. America was not yet at war. And as the head of the Secret Service, he also calculated that it would be good to have goodwill between the countries. So if the American embassy in Berlin has asked for this favor to go find this Jew and get him out, then again, America was not yet in the war. Perhaps it would be helpful to have those diplomatic ties, that diplomatic connection. So he went to get one of his most trusted soldiers, Major Ernst Blach. Bottom of page three is a picture of him. Those are his military ID papers. You look, he looks disfigured, a little bit deformed. And there's a reason why. 1914, the outbreak of World War I, he had volunteered for World War I at the age of 16. You talk about a proud German, talk about somebody who wanted to go fight for the German people, German pride. He was only 16 years old, the outbreak of World War I, and Ernst Bloch decided to volunteer. He was engaged in World War I in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and a bayonet, if you're queasy, don't listen, the bayonet went up under his chin, through his face, up out his skull, divided his face in half. He was left for dead in the battlefield with a bayonet going through, <laughs> dividing his face. And when a bulldozer came to move all the bodies into a ditch, they heard a scream. One person screamed out, and it was Ernst Bloch. He had not yet died. He was rescued. He underwent 20 surgeries in four months. And when his face healed as much as it would, he went right back to the battlefield. Three more years of service and entrance officer. He suffered eight more injuries. By the time now he's being recruited by Willem Canaris, by the head of the Secret Service, he has earned already the equivalent of nine purple hearts, two bronze stars, two silver stars. This is a decorated, decorated soldier, glutton for punishment, um, an individual who almost died several times, and he's still faithfully serving the German army. 1924, he got a doctorate in economics. 1933, he rejoins the army of the Third Reich, and in 1935, Canaris hires him to be the head of espionage division of the Adver. Now, the problem is, the problem is, in World War I, he was able to serve with no problem, but Ernst Bloch has a problem. He's half Jewish. He's half Jewish. So at the time, you can get an application. There was a whole group of individuals like this called the Mischling. Mischling soldiers were partly Jewish. I alluded to earlier, there were 60,000 half Jews and 90,000 quarter Jewish soldiers in the German army in World War II. In his book, again, he... That's his first book, but even this, he documents all of this and brings all of the, the sources for it. And he calculated, this is astonishing, because it's almost impossible to imagine this. You have people who are partly Jewish. Maybe they even were raised Jewish or thought they were Jewish. They thought the dominant part of who they were was Jewish, who served in the Jewish, in the German army that was persecuting and performing a genocide against their own people. Of the 150,000 partly Jewish soldiers in the German army, each, on average, lost seven immediate relatives in the Holocaust. Of the 150 partly Jewish German soldiers in the Holocaust, on average, they lost seven immediate Jewish relatives in the, in the army. So what do you do? So Michelin, Michelin soldiers had an option. They could apply for an exemption from the Nazis that would enable them to live, essentially, to erase or censor the Jewish part of who they were. So Ernst and Blach is a blonde, good German. He looks like an Aryan, part of the superior race, Whoopi Goldberg, and uh, bent on, bent on uh, exterminating the Jewish race. And Hitler himself signs, in fact, again, it's in the book, Hitler himself signs the exemption that Ernst Blach is able to participate as a German army officer, even though he's of Jewish descent. Not only is Major Ernst Blach this decorated German army officer, put in command of the group. The group were going to go find the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rayats, who is now hiding in Atwick and in Warsaw, included Sergeant Klaus Schenk, a half Jew, and Private Johannes Hamburger, a quarter Jew. So the three German officers, a major, a sergeant, and a private, who are going to go find the Rebbe and release him, are all part Jews. They're assigned. They're assigned. Canaris picks Bloch, why? Because he's intelligent, he's professional, he speaks German and three other foreign languages, and he's the one who's going to be able to go and find him. He calls him into his office, he sends him to Warsaw, he says, go find the biggest rabbi in the world. Here's what he looks like, he's got a big furry hat, 
a long beard, go and rescue him. So can you imagine Ernst Blach in his uniform with his swastika starts and shows up in Warsaw and says, I'm looking for the Rebbe, I'm here to rescue him. Can you imagine what a Lubavitch Chassid thinks? You're here to rescue him? What are you, crazy? You think we're about to hand over our Rebbe? He goes door to door asking Orthodox Jews where the Rebbe is. How could it be? It's ineffective. They're not getting anywhere because what Chassid is going to hand over their Rebbe to somebody who's a decorated German soldier still wearing a German uniform. So Canara sends info to Washington and uh, he says, we're, we're having this problem. So Washington decides to contact Lubavitch in Crown Heights, who contacts Lubavitch in Riga, Latvia, who contacts the Lubavitchers in Warsaw and say, it's legit. Someone find the Rebbe. This has the approval. He's, uh, he has the ability to leave. So you can imagine Ernst Blach, who's got swastikas and scars and a deformed face from having served in the Jewish army, is asking everyone, hey, where's the Rebbe? And uh, finally, because they intervened in this, uh, in this way, they are, uh, they're able to find him. So Ernst Blach and this other um, half-Jew, Sergeant Klaus Schenk and Private Johannes Hamburger, they take the Rebbe, but the Rebbe refuses to go alone. All the diplomatic efforts had gained immunity for the Rebbe, the Rebbe says, but he says, I'm not going. I want an entourage of 20. My family members, my closest chassid and my disciples, and my library. I'm not going without it. So they pack up and they start heading out from Warsaw. How do you get out from Poland? 1939, the Germans have invaded. How do you get out? So they keep getting stopped at SS places. And Blach um, has a problem because as a decorated German officer, he has a right to the first class train, first class compartment in the train. But he's going to go into the first class compartment. If he doesn't go to the first class compartment, it's very obvious something's off because why would he be traveling in coach? If he takes these 20 Hasidim and their entourage with him into the first class, he's going to have a problem. Turns out Ernst Bloch was not only a heroic decorated soldier, he was a phenomenal actor. And several points through this story, he's able to, um, first of all, when he first packs the Rebbe up to leave, when he's putting them into the car to take them, he screams at them, you dirty Jews, get in here, what's taking you so long? He puts on this facade, the charade, so that if there's anybody onlooking, any SS guard, any other people watching, who would doubt why is he taking all these Jews, he already uh, makes it look like he's taking them um, to be uh, hostile to them. At each of these SS check, box, he, check blocks, he goes through a, a similar uh, charade, and ultimately he's able to, with his acting skills, get them into the first-class cabin on the train, a station that was just outside of Warsaw. They go to Berlin. They go to Berlin instead of directly to the Lithuanian border, which is where they want to go. Latvian diplomats give them travel papers. When the Rebbe crosses into Lithuania, finally now he's safe. He's greeted in Riga by hundreds of Hasidim. They're singing, they're dancing. He has his books with him, his library, the 40,000, his entourage of, of 20. The details of exactly each of these encounters and the SS checkpoints where Ernst Blach has to, there's, there's one of the checkpoints. He describes this in the book. One of the checkpoints, an SS guard says, here, something doesn't add up. And he sees Ernst Blach's ID, and he says, there's nothing, you're, you're connected to the Secret Service. Why do you have an entourage of 20 visibly Orthodox Jews, of Hasidic Jews? Something doesn't add up. I need to make a phone call. So Ernst Blach tells him, and he starts to list off all these names, Canaris and other very high-ranking names. He says, I know them personally, and if you don't let me through this moment, I have orders to take these Jews to have them get killed. If you don't let me through immediately, I'm going to call. And he starts to rattle off the highest, most recognizable names with whom he does have a real relationship. So the lowly SS guard at the checkpoint, who correctly sees that something's wrong, but gets afraid and figures he'd rather let them through and make the mistake than in fact be wrong and pay the price if a higher up is called. And that's one example where Ernst Blach, who, who risked his life, because it wasn't a simple, uh, a simple rescue mission, but was really committed to, to this uh, mission, gets them through that and other places. They go through Berlin to the border of Lithuania uh, into Riga, Latvia. The Rebbe has prominent individuals pushing his case while he's in Riga, Latvia, so he gets a visa. But he had to remain in Riga for a few more weeks, um, and, and he, barely, he barely got out in time because a few weeks after he left, uh, he likely would have been killed. The Nazis invaded Norway, Denmark. There were two ships. The Rebbe gets out on a ship. The two ships that left before the Rebbe each got hit by a torpedo and everyone had died. 
The two ships after the Rebbe each got hit by a torpedo and everyone died. And again, the Rebbe is able to uh, to get out when everyone else died. Um, and there are other many other examples of the miraculous nature that he was able to uh, escape from mines in the sea that he shouldn't have been able to get out, and so on. Um, 1941, the elected officials who had saved him saved his books. And uh, there's a sort of a postscript to the story that's terrifically sad is that the Rebbe was able to get himself out, but couldn't get other people out, though he could get books out. That was the way it was at the time. We all know what was happening in America, where they closed down immigration and terrible chapter in America's history of uh, real anti-Semitic uh, Morgantown and others who had closed down, shut down immigration. But it was a time where books could come in, but people and lives couldn't. By mid-December, all the arrangements for the escape of the Rebbe and his family were agreed upon. They had the funds, they were, um, they were collected, and, uh, and he was able to come. Um, yeah. Riga. When did they come from Riga? So with the escalating war, it was clear they couldn't stay in Riga either, that it was going to be next on the list. In early February, visas to America were finally received, but they couldn't leave for another month because the Rebbe had fallen and broke his hand. And the Rebbe's mother, who was 80 at the time, had emergency her hernia surgery, so they couldn't leave yet. They eventually crossed the Baltic Sea in a small 18-seater airplane. And uh, they go to Stockholm, and which was just three months before the Russian invasion of Latvia. From Stockholm, they took a train to Gothenburg. They joined 523 passengers on the SS Drottningholm, which departed to New York. March 19, 1940, the Rebbe the Rayats arrives to a large crowd of Hasidim, in New York. 1940, the Rats is living in the Greystone Hotel in Manhattan's Upper West Side. He spent Pesach that year in Lakewood. He was offered to move the Chabad court to Lakewood. That would have been an interesting irony. The Lakewood Yeshiva and Chabad's headquarters in Lakewood. He decided it was too on the outskirts. He focused and studied where to go in the New York area. He liked Brooklyn, and he decided on the upper middle class town, the city, the area of Crown Heights. Now, just a, a side script to this, and we'll, and we'll end. Who came with him and who didn't? There was an entourage of 20, which included several family members and included several Hasidim, but didn't include everybody. His son-in-law and daughter, the, the seventh Rebbe, the Rebbe, were in Paris at the time. They were waiting for visas. They had been separated. They had been studying in Berlin. They had been separated. He was in Paris waiting for visas. There was a huge bottleneck of refugees looking to depart from Lisbon, and all the Portuguese visas had been suspended. They weren't being issued. So it looked like he was going to be stuck. They were going to be stuck in Paris. And the situation in Paris and France was getting worse. May 24th, a telegram was received that Portuguese visas had been granted. So now they had the visas to be able to go. What they were missing was tickets on a transatlantic passage. You could have the visa, but if you don't have a ticket on the boat, on the ship, then you are in trouble. And they were running out of time, incredibly running out of time. June 11th, Mordechai Bistritsky. Bistritsky used to be members of our, now they live in Boca Grove. His parent, grandparents. Mordechai Bistritsky was a Boyan or Chassid who had married a Lubavitch girl at a ceremony. The Masada condition from that marriage was the Rebbe Rashab himself. And so he went to go see the riots in New York. Bistritsky's in-laws had purchased tickets for the following day on what would be one of the last ships out but they were stuck in Spain and they were unable to get visas to be able to be on the ship. So Bistritsky offered to transfer the tickets to the Schneersons, to the Rebbe and the Rebetzin, and they did. So the Rebbe had gotten the visa, but he didn't have the tickets, and only because of Bistritsky's initiative and generosity to transfer the tickets that his in-laws couldn't use anyway, did they get out. That's the miracle of how the Rebbe and the Rebetzin got to America. Tragically, Bistritsky's in-laws never got out of Spain. Ultimately, they died and they were killed in Auschwitz. The Rayats got several of his Hasidim out, but probably the biggest personal tragedy of his life was the failed rescue of his own daughter, Shana, and her husband, Menek Horenstein. He couldn't get him out of Poland, despite all of his efforts and diplomatic uh, maneuvering, and ultimately they were murdered in Treblinka. So that is the story of the Rebbe of the Rayats' rescue. On page four, you have a picture on the top of uh, March 1940, waiting to step onto the shores of America. He's on the boat, on the ship. It's a picture of him on the ship. Uh, underneath it is a letter from the Rebbe to the Secretary of State, thanking the Secretary of State for the diplomatic efforts that were done on his behalf to help rescue him and to help find him 
and to help coordinate his safe passage and to help get him and to help get him out. Uh, the last two pages I wanted to learn with you, although it's late, maybe you'll learn it on your own. But this was a speech on the first day of Balak, Tafrish Pei Zion. This was a speech that the Rebbe the Rayats had given. Um, it was sent by the Russians to exile. And while boarding the train, remember we talked about that he was not going to be put to death, but he had to spend three years in the camp. Ultimately, it was commuted after eight days. So on the train to go report and surrender in the Russian prison where he was supposed to be sentenced for three years, this was the speech that he gave from the train to the crowd. And you see it says that. He got up on the train, before it departed. When he was taking leave, he turned to the audience. He turned to the audience who had escorted him there. And Vayomer, and he said the following. It's in the Yiddish, which, but for your sake, I would read it in the Hebrew on the bottom. Just joking, it's for my sake. In the Hebrew on the bottom, and it tells us the story. And it's the Rebbe's fiery, defiant, confident, filled with Amuna message to the Hasidim while he's on the train about to go to his three-year term, sentenced by the Russians for his illegal activity. What happened to Canaris and Ernst Bloch. It's a very sad part of the story. It's one of the last chapters in the book. He calls it the fate of the rescuers. What was the fate of the rescuers? So Ernst Bloch went back to work after he found the Rebbe, got him through these SS checkpoints, got him to Riga, Latvia. He went back to work in the secret service of the Germans. He eventually also, this story is not nearly as well known either. He was involved in rescuing the Gera Rebbe and getting him to Palestine. So he, he's, there's actually controversy over whether Yad Vashem has recognized these two, Canaris and Ernst Bloch, as a righteous Gentile for rescuing the, the Rebbe, the Rayats, and here the Ger Rebbe. Um, and then he died in battle one week before the war ended, Ernst Bloch. Canaris, ultimately, because he's a proud German head of the Secret Service, but defiant to Hitler's plan of the final solution, is arrested. He's sent to a concentration camp. His nose was cut off. And one week before the war ended, he was hanged and killed. So you have these individuals who were responsible for saving the Rebbe, the Rayats. Through that, saving the Rebbe of Menachem Mendel Schneerson and the Chabad Hasidus that we enjoy and benefit from and are inspired by around the world today would not have happened without, without all of them, without all of them. So it's a happy story for the Rebbe, the Rayats. Not completely happy as he failed to be able to get his own daughter out. And his children died, were killed, were murdered in Treblinka. And it's a sad postscript that the very people who had rescued him were unable to survive the story, the war themselves. Thank you very, very much. Have a wonderful evening.